All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Hands On. My name is Alana and I'm from the Innovation Cluster. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Innovation Cluster, we're a not-for-profit organization that supports startups working in innovation. So we do so by offering advisory services, access to partners and workshops such as this one. So if you have an innovative idea or a startup working in technology, we encourage you to apply at www.innovationcluster.ca. So again, welcome to Hands On, how to recognize and disarm the effects of stress. So today we have Diane Wolf of Diane Wolf Counseling facilitating the session. So Diane is a registered psychotherapist and certified clinical trauma professional. So today, Diane's going to go over how to recognize and disarm the effects of stress on your mental health and how to create a unique stress management plan. So there's a ton of content that's going to be covered during this session, so there may not be time for a Q&A at the end, but we will provide Diane's information if you plan to reach out to her. So I'm going to quickly just give it over to Diane to get started. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I guess this is indeed a very timely topic with so many people signed up. I'm absolutely thrilled at the opportunity to help each one of you develop your own customized stress management plan so that you can avoid some of these harmful effects of stress. There is going to be a lot of content covered. I would encourage you to have paper and pen handy, or if you are technologically adept and you can figure out a way to take notes on your computer while looking at a screen, go for it. But you will want to make some notes because you're going to personalize a lot of what I say to your own situation. So... I won't ask you to raise your hands or put this in the chat, but I bet a lot of you are like me. When the check engine light comes on in your car, your instant response is to go, yeah, yeah, I'll get to that at some point. And we ignore those yellow lights. Now, there's a problem with that because eventually if we ignore them for too long, we end up with a red light a red light that basically forces us to stop. Now, in my practice as a psychotherapist, I work primarily with first responders and frontline professionals who've been diagnosed with PTSD. And that's really the red light coming on. And many of them have said to me, if only I had met you 15 years ago and learned what you're teaching me now, I probably could have prevented this breakdown. I could have prevented the red light coming on. And the secret is recognizing the yellow lights and dealing with them before we end up in that red light situation. So today we're gonna to talk about how to recognize your own unique pattern of yellow lights that come on for you. There is no cookie cutter solution just as we're all unique individuals, but there are a lot of commonalities in terms of the symptoms that we experience that are basically our brain saying, hello, pay attention to me, you need to deal with me. So we're gonna talk a lot about those yellow lights and how to deal with them. I do need to give this disclaimer, I am not a doctor, and many of the symptoms that are a result of stress could also be indications of an underlying medical condition. So for example, headaches are a classic sign, tension headaches of stress, but as we know, they could be a sign of something more serious. So if you're feeling any of these physical symptoms, I would encourage you to seek medical attention just to rule out an underlying medical condition. But when your doctor says to you, nope, your heart's fine, it's just anxiety. That's when you know, okay, this is a yellow light that I need, I need to deal with. So here are some of the physical symptoms. I'm gonna go through this list and I would encourage you to make notes if these are any of the things that you're experiencing. There is a handout available. Uh, you can request it at the end. There's a link to go and request it or you can take a screenshot of the handout. The first part of the handout lists these symptoms on, a, on the stress management plan and asks you to select the ones that you experience. You can highlight, circle, write them down, whoever you want to. But we'll just start with the physical symptoms. They're actually in three categories, physical, cognitive, and emotional. One of the most classic hallmark symptoms of dealing with stress is to experience sleep disturbances. Now, some people find it difficult to get to sleep. That would be the person whose head hits the pillow, they're really tired, and as soon as they go to bed, all of a sudden the brain wakes up and starts thinking about all the things you need to do or all the things you need to worry about. So that's one type of sleep disturbance. Other people find it difficult to stay asleep. They may get to sleep just fine, but they wake up and it's midnight or one o'clock or two o'clock. And then we get into that vicious cycle of, oh no, I have to get to sleep right away or I won't get enough sleep. 
So if you're experiencing sleep disturbances, that's something you want to make note of. Now, the topic of sleep hygiene is an entire module in one of the courses that I teach, but there are lots of different things that we can do to improve our sleep. So make a note if that's one of the things that you're struggling with. I mentioned headaches before, constant headaches. Again, could be a medical issue, but could very easily be a symptom of stress. Digestive issues. It's very interesting. They've recently discovered there really is a link between the brain and the stomach. It's called the polyvagal nerve. But you know, if you've ever had the experience of, of getting bad news or being startled and you have that sense that your stomach drops, there's a reason for that. There is a direct connection. So when we're feeling stress, quite often it affects our stomachs. That can be diarrhea, that can be um, you know, stomach pains, that can be constipation, all sorts of acid reflux, all sorts of different digestive issues. So again, keep track of that one. Muscle tension is another one. You may find that you carry tension in your shoulders, in your neck, that's very common. Bruxism is a fancy word for those of us who grind our teeth in our sleep. Um, at one point I actually had a mouth guard that the dentist prescribed because I was wearing down my teeth just from clenching my teeth during the night. The jaw muscle is the strongest muscle in our body and there's a lot of pressure we can put on our jaw and our teeth if we clench our jaw. Now, this one, chest pain or rapid heart rate, again, if that's something you experience on a regular basis, you would certainly want to get that checked. But sometimes your doctor will do the ultrasound, do some heart testing and say, nope, it's just anxiety. That's very common. And in that case, you have to think, okay, this is a yellow light that my, my brain is sending me warning there's something I need to deal with. Uh, panic or anxiety attacks, feeling agitated, feeling like you're, you're that whole that goes along with heart racing quite often too. Your blood pressure may be affected. You may have high blood pressure that you haven't been diagnosed with before. That's often a result of accumulated stress over the years that hasn't been dealt with. A feeling of exhaustion, even if you feel that you're getting enough rest. And weight loss or gain, I should put here, unintentional. If you're on a diet, you're losing weight, good for you. But sometimes our weight can be affected by the, phys it's a physical sign of being under stress. So I want to emphasize that if you're feeling some of these things, there's nothing wrong with your brain. This is how the brain is designed to work. It sends us these warning signs so that we'll pay attention. And if, so, of course, what we're going to do today is figure out which are the ones I'm experiencing and what am I going to do to manage them now before they result in long-term uh, physical effects. Something like high blood pressure really should be dealt with or, you know, chest pains and all of those things. We're going to deal with those. So those are the physical symptoms that are quite common. Cognitive symptoms, uh, brain fog is, I think, one of the most common. Just that feeling that you're having difficulty focusing, that everything, your memory might be going. We have difficulty, you know, with, with remembering things. I find a lot of people are, are noticing that right now with what we've been going through the last two years. It's, expect, it's particularly prevalent. And a lot of people are saying, oh, no, I think, you know, I'm just getting old and it's early onset Alzheimer's. I certainly can't diagnose that, but I would encourage you to realize it's an extremely common result of stress. It's a result of our brain wanting to protect us and so we're sort of minimizing our cognitive functioning so that we won't be able to think as clearly. It's another protective mechanism. As is hypervigilance, that feeling that all of a sudden nothing feels safe. Again, very common. It's, it's one of the hallmarks of PTSD, but it's also something that happens when we're feeling very stressed, that we lose that sense of feeling safe. Everything feels dangerous. And of course, in the pandemic particularly, many of our previous activities, going to a hockey game, being in a crowd, going to a crowded grocery store, those used to be very safe activities that aren't necessarily feeling safe anymore. Those racing thoughts where you feel like you're going downhill a million miles a minute and you really can't control your thought process, that's very common as well. And forgetfulness. I don't know about you, but I've really learned to just write everything down. My kids know if they ask me to babysit my grandchildren um, and I say yes, the next thing they say is, is it in your day book? Uh, because if it isn't written down, it is likely to be forgotten. And that's been particularly troublesome the last couple of years. Then we deal with emotional symptoms, becoming easily angry. And again, these are emotional symptoms that are outside the norm for you. 
we all become angry sometimes, but if you feel that you're becoming angry more often, more quickly, more easily, or more frustrated, or more teary than you normally are, or moodier than you normally are, that can be your brain sending you a message that's a yellow light. Feeling overwhelmed, uh, particularly for entrepreneurs, business owners, people who have a large staff, there is so much to do. And when we're feeling stressed, we become overwhelmed a lot more easily. Feeling a need to control others, that's again been particularly prevalent during the pandemic because I think many of us have come to realize we really don't have as much control over things as we thought we did. So we often hunker down and become even more controlling in the areas that we are able to manage. Uh, another emotional symptom is avoiding others, avo avoiding social situations, not wanting to talk to people. That can be a sign that that's a result of stress. And difficulty in relaxing. When you finally have time to take an hour off and you decide to sit and relax and you still feel agitated and you feel like you just can't sit still, you have to keep moving, moving around, that can certainly be a problem as well. And you may experience, and I say prolonged periods of feeling worthless or sad or guilty or hopeless. We all experience those feelings at times, but you may notice that your negative emotions are taking over more time. So that would be something to be aware of as well. So again, that's a long list, but this is the first page of the handout and you're welcome to take a screenshot of it if you like. And what I would like you to do either by taking a screenshot or by requesting the handout is go down this list again and spend a few minutes thinking about each one and come up with your own unique category of symptoms that are bothering you. I, for example, don't anger easily, but I find I get teary, I, I'm more likely to become teary more quickly. So that's something under the emotional that I notice about myself. Um, I, I also become impatient a little more easily than normal if I'm feeling stressed. But the trick is to look at this mixed bag of symptoms and, and decide which are the ones that are, that are affecting me, because those are the ones that we're going to work on. All right, why do we use the right foot on both the gas and the brakes? I would love for you to put in the chat, anybody know why we would put use the right foot for both the gas and the brakes? I'll give you about a minute to answer. I'll give you the answer otherwise, but anybody know? To avoid the risk of using both together. Yes, thank you so much. Exactly. We don't want to use them both together. It would burn out our engine. It sounds really simplistic, but we know if we're driving down the highway at a quick speed and something happens and we need to stop, we don't just put the left foot on the brakes while the right foot is on the gas. We can't apply them both at the same time. We want to take our foot off the gas, off the brakes, no, off the gas, and then use that foot to put on the brakes. Yeah, somebody said their father-in-law uses both feet. Well, okay, as long as we're not using them both at the same time, I guess we can live with that. So why do I say this? Because quite often when we're agitated or stressed or tense, people will say things to us like, relax, just calm down, take a deep breath. Those are all techniques to put the brakes on and they're wonderful strategies, but if our foot is still full on the gas, they don't make sense. Before I can relax, calm down, zen chill, I need to take my foot off the gas. And so that's exactly what we want to do with our brain. Oh, got to turn the chat off there to do that. Okay. I'm not sure why this screen won't move forward. Can't get to the next slide. That'll cause stress. There we go. All right. So many of us, I'm sure, live in Peterborough and you've seen the lift locks. I love using the lift locks as an analogy because one of the things that is really important to know about lift locks is that you can't have both chambers at the top at the same time and you can't have them at the bottom at the same time. Now, I have noticed in the winter they're both at the bottom, but that ruins my story, so we'll ignore that. Ideally, when one chamber is up, the other chamber is down. And then as this one comes down, the other one goes up. And at some point, they're actually together in the middle. 
And that is our goal. It's not the goal for the lift lock because the boat would go nowhere, but our goal is to have the two chambers in equilibrium, both in the center. And when I say the two chambers, what I'm talking about is the autonomic nervous system. You don't have to remember what it's called. You, there's not a test at the end of this, but basically we have a lift lock in our brain and it is called the autonomic nervous system. And it has two parts. Those are the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for what we call the fight or flight reflex. It's if you are in danger, your brain quickly sends a lot of cortisol and adrenaline flooding through your body and it prepares you to take physical action. Whether that's to run out of danger or fight a wild animal, that's what happens when that cortisol and adrenaline is flooding your body. It's preparing you to fight or fight, uh, fight or flee or even freeze sometimes. Sometimes people experience a freeze response. The parasympathetic nervous system is what we call the zen chill. That's when you're really relaxed and just feeling just great, Nothing, nothing's going wrong. And ideally they want to live in equilibrium because we always want to be prepared at any minute to be able to respond to danger. In which case the sympathetic nervous system would jump up, the parasympathetic would go down and once the danger has passed, we've gotten rid of that cortisol and adrenaline, the sympathetic goes back down, the parasympathetic comes up and we live in equilibrium again. And that's the ideal state. So what we have to do is we have to figure out how do I disarm the effects of stress? First, I have to reduce the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. That's the equivalent of taking my foot off the gas. And then once I've taken my foot off the gas, now I can work on increasing the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's the stepping on the brakes activity. And that's why it's so important to recognize they have to happen in a certain order. Because if I am extremely stressed and extremely agitated and someone says to me, relax, it doesn't work. I'm too high up here. I can't just jump to the bottom. I need to gradually reduce it. So the number one thing we, we do is we reduce, we release cortisol and adrenaline with physical activity. This is the second page of the handout. Again, you're welcome to take a screenshot, but these are the strategies we need to implement. And this is where we're gonna be spending a lot of our time today is talking about finding strategies that work for you. So yes, physical activity is absolutely the best solution because what has happened is our brain has flooded us with cortisol and adrenaline, preparing us to react to a danger. And the only way to get rid of that cortisol and adrenaline is to do something physical. That's the fastest way to get it out of our body. The problem is in our society today, the stresses that we face are not likely to be a wild tiger running at us from out of the, out of the forest or a bear, or we're not likely to have to fight. So there isn't a physical response that is required. When you hear stories, for example, of someone who was able to lift a car off a child and they use superhuman energy, we all hear these stories about someone was able to do something that seemed superhuman. That's because the cortisol and adrenaline that flooded their body gave them that superhuman strength for a brief period of time so they could react physically. That's a really good thing that can save someone's life. But that response is meant to be very rare and very temporary. And after the danger has passed, the cortisol and adrenaline go down again and equilibrium is restored. The problem that we face is because we're facing often daily stressors and worries and pressures, especially in the pandemic, but even before, we're always dealing with stress. And quite often the cortisol and adrenaline are left coursing through our veins and causing us to feel that agitation and stress and if we don't do something physical to release it, it takes a long time for that level to go back down. So think of an example, I like to use a driving example. You're driving down the highway and the car in front of you slams on its brakes. You don't stop to think, oh, that's not good. I see red brake lights coming on in the vehicle ahead of me. I think perhaps I will swerve or put on my brakes. You wouldn't have time to do that. You would have already smashed into that car. So what happens is our brain, again, in its wisdom, bypasses cognitive functioning. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, it 
we call it the amygdala hijack. You don't have to know that either, but it basically bypasses cognitive thinking and goes straight to response. So normally something happens, we assess the situation, we decide how to respond. When the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, something happens, we have an automatic immediate response and then we stop to think about it. I work with a number of law enforcement officers and I often tell them, stop telling people not to swerve if an animal runs out in front of them. Because it's not like people are taking a minute to think, oh, what should I do? There's a deer running out in front of me. Oh yes, I shouldn't swerve and I shouldn't slam on the brakes. I should just, no, we don't have time for that. You automatically react before you have a chance to think about it. That's normal. We don't wanna lose that ability. We don't want to live so deeply in the Zen chill state with our sympathetic nervous system so deactivated that we're unable to respond to danger. If you're walking down the street and you hear a loud noise behind you, you want to be able to jump out of the way before you figure out that there's a, a tree branch falling or something. So we want to be able to respond quickly to danger, but we also want to be able to get back to equilibrium as quickly as possible. So releasing cortisol and adrenaline with physical activity is the best thing. And the, if you can get your heart rate up so that you're really, the blood is pumping through your veins, that's the best way to dissipate what I call the nasty hormones, the cortisol and adrenaline. Crying, believe it or not, is also a good one. It's a release of that tension. It releases those hormones. Sometimes venting to a friend can also be really helpful. But I'll just take a minute here and I'll ask you to think about some sports or activities that you find help you calm down, releasing that adrenaline. And you're welcome to share them in the chat so we can all get some really good ideas about things that you find help calm you down, get your heart rate up. And I'll share mine. I love taking Zumba classes. And I find after an hour of Zumba, I am back to Zen chill for sure. So feel free to share in the chat some of the things that you do. Jogging somebody, but walking my dog. Oh, swimming. Oh, these are going so fast. Dancing, weightlifting. Beautiful, beautiful ideas. So again, when you, uh, after this workshop, I would encourage you to take a few minutes and really think, oh, Marilyn goes snowshoeing. That's a great one. Yeah, very physical exercise. Olivia does does Zumba too. Fantastic. Yes. Oh, Inika has a hot bath. Beautiful ideas. Feel free to check the chat. There are some really great ideas coming up here and you certainly want to be able to, you know, get some of those ideas to establish, again, your own unique plan. So if one person says, I love to go running, that may be a fantastic thing for those of us who are over 60 and are not going to run, we need to find something else, but you're going to develop your own plan. And ideally you can think of more than three, but you're going to have a list so that the next time you're feeling stressed, you can post it on your fridge. You can take the handout if you request it, post it on the fridge, make a list, but you wanna have access to those great ideas so that you don't have to think of them. Because remember when you're under a lot of stress, cognitive functioning is impaired. So I don't expect you to be able to think of these things when you're in the middle of feeling very agitated and stressed. You wanna have them accessible so that you can read your list and go, oh yeah, I was gonna do that when I feel stressed. Okay, so that's taking your foot off the gas. That's reducing the sympathetic nervous system activation. And then once you've started that coming down, now we can work on increasing the parasympathetic nervous system activation. And I have some slides coming up that have some great ideas for both of those. So this is the step on the brakes thing. Now, again, what number one thing we can do? Deep breathing. So I'm going to teach you a technique. If you've done meditation or yoga, you may have already learned some really effective ways of deep breathing. I encourage you, don't stop doing those. Those are awful. Those are awesome. But here's one that you can use very easily. And it's called, um, I have a slide here coming up with that too, intercostal diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, you don't have to remember that either. But basically our lungs are pear-shaped. They're smaller at the top and wider at the bottom. And we often have a tendency to breathe very shallow. If you go to the doctor and you've got a cough and, and he or she puts the stethoscope on your chest and says, take a deep breath. If you do this, you have not taken a deep breath. You've just filled the top part of your lungs with air. What you want to do is fill the bottom of your lungs with air. And the way to do that is using your diaphragm. You want to do belly breathing. You want to feel your stomach actually moving in and out and your shoulders should stay completely stable. 
So I'm gonna explain this and then we're all gonna close our eyes for a minute and do it together. So you wanna sit comfortably where your feet are both on the ground. You can stand up if you want. And you wanna focus on putting your shoulders back and then not letting them move. So if you see me doing this, I'm not doing it right. We're gonna close our eyes anyway. Then you put your hands on your stomach and you focus on what do I need to do to breathe and feel my stomach go out. And when I figured that out, and if you have difficulty with this, best thing you can do, lay on the floor with a heavy textbook, if anybody has textbooks anymore, heavy textbook on your stomach and see what you need to do to make that book go up and down. And that's when you'll know you've got that technique. We wanna breathe in through the mouth for a count of four, and then in through the nose for a count of four, out through the mouth for a count of seven. The reason we do that is because breathing in activates our sympathetic nervous system, breathing out activates the parasympathetic. So this is something where we want to be focusing on the relaxation, the Zen chill mechanism. So if everybody could close their eyes for a minute, and then I want you to take a deep breath in as slowly as you can and count to four, and then release it through your mouth for a count of seven. And you can put your hands on your stomach so you can see if it's actually moving. Okay, ready, go. And one more time, in for four. out for seven. Okay, I won't ask anyone to admit this, but many of you might have felt somewhat lightheaded when you did that. That's a sign that your brain normally isn't getting enough oxygen. So if you felt a bit lightheaded, this is something you really want to implement into your regular routine. If you found this really difficult because you felt agitated and couldn't relax, then again, that's a sign that your sympathetic nervous system might be too activated to allow you to activate the parasympathetic. So you'll want to work on that as well. Some of the other things you can do to step on the brakes are grounding, uh, Focusing on what do I see, what do I smell, what do I hear, what sensation am I experiencing, helps us to focus on the here and now rather than the things that we're worried about. Uh, some stretching exercises like yoga, for example, are more conducive to activating the parasympathetic nervous system because they're that relaxing thing. So for many people doing something physically agitating is helpful to do before you do something like yoga so you really are in the best frame of mind to be able to relax. Um, you can visit with a friend, you can look at other comfort measures. I know somebody mentioned a hot bath which is a beautiful beautiful thing to do there. So I'll ask you to take a minute and list some other activities that you find help you relax and again feel, feel free to put them in the chat so that other people can benefit from seeing your great ideas too. Yeah, someone said, I'm triggered right now, should I leave? No, don't leave, but recognize that deep breathing is something you do want to uh, really implement. A meditation app, beautiful. Yep, journaling, yelling in the woods, good. Reading a book, yeah, sleeping, yeah, skiing and treadmill, beautiful. I think there's probably gonna be a way to save the chat because there are some absolutely fantastic ideas in here. Stretching, yeah, so do, do check out the, the chat because there are some, just some really drinking a glass of water. Yeah, we'll talk about hydration in a few minutes, the, the importance of being well hydrated. Okay, so trying to figure, there we go. All right, so here are some tools you can use to decrease sympathetic nervous system activation. I already mentioned why we do exercise because it dissipates the cortisol and the adrenaline. We're also going to add tight time outdoors here. Why? Because it increases serotonin and dopamine, what we call the hero hormones. So if you combine those two, now again, I know it's been minus 30 and you, know, you might be going to the gym. There's absolutely nothing wrong with exercising indoors, but when the weather is conducive to it, the Japanese have a habit that they call forest bathing. I don't know if you've heard of that. That's been a big thing the last couple of years, but there have been studies done that show that there is a lot of benefit to just being in the outdoors. It is very calming and soothing because it increases our what we call the, the hero hormones or the happy hormones. So if you exercise outdoors, 
you're getting rid of the bad stuff and bringing in the good stuff. And so that is you know, absolutely the number one best thing you can do. But fortunately, there are other things we can do as well. Um, any of those other exercises, any of those activities that we talked about uh, are certainly important. And then tools we can use to increase the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the breathing that we just did, also known as deep breathing, belly breathing, really important things that we can do. But remember, this is taking our foot off the brake, off the gas. This is putting on the brakes. We can't put on the brakes until we've taken our foot off the gas. That's uh, really important to remember. Okay, so what are some of the other things we can do to increase parasympathetic nervous system activation? Uh, massage, I don't know if anybody mentioned that one. It's a really good one as well. Uh, hobbies, uh, a lot of people have taken up things like painting during the pandemic and diamond painting. And for a while you couldn't even buy a jigsaw puzzle because these are all really good distraction techniques that help us relax. Uh, walking, spending time with friends, meditation, mindfulness, belonging to a faith community, relaxation, exercises, uh, a gratitude practice, thinking of the things that we can be thankful for are also really helpful as well. But anything that you find relaxing. So again, you've come up with some of those ideas, which is great, the activities that help you relax. Um, so keep a list. Uh, we mentioned that sometimes when people are under stress, they avoid social situations. And let's face it, it's been a lot easier to be a, a hermit uh, right now. Uh, so we, we certainly want to make sure that we, we do get it into some social, some social times so that we can relax with other people around and, and have some, a support network. So step three of our plan is to prevent. So step one was to recognize what are the signals that my brain sends me to tell me that I am under stress? Because that would be a unique combination. Again, not the cookie cutter idea. I need to know what are the signs for me that I'm under stress. And then step two was to disarm, reducing the effects of that stress when it's happening. So that's looking at when I'm feeling stressed right now, what are the things I can do to get rid of that cortisol and adrenaline as quickly as possible? and then be able to step on the brakes and be able to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. But those are the things we do in the moment when we're feeling stressed as a response to feeling stressed. The third step is we wanna prevent feeling stressed as much as we can. We want to become more re resilient by working in some healthy habits so that our level of stress tolerance is increased. So when I said that the, you know, the lift blocks in your brain, we like to be in equilibrium. In essence, there's a window of tolerance that we want to sit in. So we want to be, even if our sympathetic nervous system is slightly activated, we don't want to be either up or either down in either direction. We want to be somewhat in equilibrium. And that's where we want to live. And if we're under stress all the time, we're living in a situation where our sympathetic nervous system is almost constantly on high alert. And that's what causes those physical symptoms that we talked about at the very beginning, whether it's high blood pressure, digestive issues. When your sympathetic nervous system is activated and you're under a lot of stress, not only does cognitive functioning shut down, but many of the things like digestive functions and everything else are also put on the back burner to allow you to be able to focus all your energy and attention to dealing with the danger, the imminent danger. But you don't wanna be living like that every day. So we wanna find ways once the current stress level has passed, once I've taken control of deactivating the sympathetic nervous system and activating the parasympathetic and I'm feeling calm, now I need to look at what is my stress management plan going to be moving forward? What can I do so that when stressful events happen, they don't trigger the sympathetic nervous system so quickly? It's important to notice that when your sympathetic nervous system is triggered, there's not much you can do about it in that moment. I'll give you an example. A lot of people who have suffered trauma find they have a pronounced startle reflex. And we certainly see this with people with PTSD. Quite often, that's another hallmark. They startle easily. 
Why is that? It's almost like the alarm system in your brain is now stuck in the on position and everything feels dangerous and you startle easily. What we want to do over the long term is gradually reduce the level of where our sympathetic nervous system responds to within that equilibrium. And then our alarm system is less likely to go off as quickly. So this is where the bulk of what we want to, we want to do comes. We do need to know how to respond to our stressful symptoms when we're in crisis. But now we want to think of what can I do every day? Now, I've only left a few lines here on the handout. You may want to journal a few pages on, on how to manage these things, but these are the areas that we want to focus on. The foundational pillar of mental health is sleep. And I mentioned earlier how important it is uh, to deal with sleep. There are, have been you know, people who've used sleep deprivation as a form of torture. And the reason is because it works. I don't know if any of you have dealt with uh, getting a new puppy or having a new baby or working shift work or anything else in your life that has uh, affected your sleep, even jet lag, but we do not function well when we're not getting enough sleep. So that's really the first thing we want to work on. So again, there are two different ways that we may find our sleep is disrupted. One is we have difficulty getting to sleep and the other is we have difficulty staying asleep and some people deal with both. So we'll talk about getting to sleep first. When we understand how our body uh, deals with sleep, we can put strategies in place to help manage that. So for example, how many of you, just type quickly in the, in the chat, how many of you would say that you know that you're a night owl or you're a morning person? And anyone have a clear, clear indication of which one they are? Some night owls, morning, night, night, morning, morning. Okay, yeah. We tend to know that about ourselves. And unfortunately, that's not something we can change. That really is, whether it's genetic or inborn, I mean, I'm not really sure how we got to be that way, but they can actually, in a sleep study, they can take you into a lab, they can measure your internal body temperature once an hour for 24 hours, and based on the results, they can tell you if you're a night person or a morning person, which I find absolutely fascinating. The reason that they can do that is because people who are naturally morning people have a temperature lowering mechanism that occurs earlier in the evening than those of us who are night owls. And that lowering of our internal body temperature signals to our body that it's going to be getting time to go to sleep soon. So that would be fine if we could all set our sleep schedules based on our natural chronotype, but sometimes we have to adjust our sleep habits to suit you know, a work schedule or something else. If you're a natural night owl who'd love to go to bed at 2 a.m. and get up at 11, that might not work for your work life. So what we can do is we can basically fool our bodies somewhat into lowering that internal body temperature at the time we want it to go down to prepare for sleep. And how do we do that? a hot bath. I know several of you mentioned in the chat that a hot bath is one of your relaxation strategies. It is a fabulous relaxation strategy. But what it also does is it heats your body up so that when you get out of the hot bath, we think, oh, now I feel all sleepy and cozy and I can go to sleep. The reason that we feel that way is because having a hot bath signals to our body to lower our internal body temperature, which then triggers the signal to go to sleep. So if you have difficulty getting to sleep, that's one thing you can try an hour or two before you wanna to go to bed is just having that hot bath and letting your internal body temperature sink down. Another thing you can try if you have difficulty uh, getting to sleep is keeping an extremely consistent sleep habit. And I'm someone, a natural night person, I have had to work very hard. My friends know I am rigid rigid about my sleeping times. So rigid that New Year's Eve, we celebrate with cousins in Austria because they're six hours ahead and we call them at six o'clock at night and celebrate New Year's Eve hours before we have to celebrate it here because I will not stay up past 10 o'clock at night. Pretty much not ever and not even New Year's. I go to bed at 10, my alarm goes off between seven and 7.30. I am well rested, I'm able to get up. I never sleep in, not weekends, not holidays, nothing. I can't. Because being a natural night owl, if I were to sleep in in the morning, I wouldn't be able to get to sleep that night. And then I'd be laying awake till two o'clock in the morning and then I'd be tired. And it just sets off this really difficult strategy, uh, difficult situation. 
Now, I do want to mention it's important that everything I offer in terms of these ideas are like a buffet dinner. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You go along a list of ideas and you go, oh, yeah, I'm going to try that. That sounds good. Or you look at an idea and you go, yeah, I have no need for that. I don't need to worry about it. That's fine. Leave it on the table. But if you do struggle with being able to get to sleep, you may find that establishing an extremely consistent routine in terms of what time you're in bed and what time your alarm goes off will really help your body adjust to that and it becomes a habit and it becomes much easier to go to sleep. Another thing we recommend if you have trouble going to sleep is avoiding um, screen time in the evening. A lot of our screens, laptops, phones uh, emit blue light and blue light actually has an energizing effect. So the last thing I wanna do is feel energized at 10 o'clock at night. So I have to be very careful with screen time. So that's something you wanna pay attention to as well. Some people will say, nope, I can watch a movie on my laptop and go right to sleep. That's great. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's great. But if you have difficulty getting to sleep, be very aware that screen time could be an issue and you may wanna look at you know, reading a book or having blue light glasses or doing something so you're not getting that blue light coming in. Uh, something else you want to do at night, and I find this extremely important, especially with what's been going on the last couple of years, and that is avoid agitating activities. Again, that's a very personal thing. What is agitating for you may not be agitating for someone else, but I used to be quite addicted to the news. And I have made a conscious decision, and I follow it for the most part. If I watch the news, it's during the morning. I do not watch the news at night anymore because I find it affects my ability to get to sleep. It affects my dreams. I have to be very conscientious about keeping my evenings <clears throat> to be very non-agitating. So those are some of the things that you can do. And if you really want to know more about this, there's a really good book that I recommend. It's, it's, it's a bit heavy. It's not an easy read by Matthew Walker called Why We Sleep. And he talks a lot about the latest in sleep research and, and what they've found in, time, in terms of how to get a good night's sleep. Uh, we really, as a society, are walking around in a state of constant sleep deprivation. We should be getting eight to nine hours a night. I know there's always someone who's an outlier and says, I do just fine on six hours. And I believe that there can be outliers. But for the most part, our bodies are designed to want eight to nine hours of sleep a night. There's a lot of restorative health benefits to sleep. And when we shortchange ourselves, they actually say it can cut short our life expectancy. So sleep hygiene is certainly something that you want to look into. And again, in the course that I teach, we talk a lot about that. Nutrition and hydration is another thing to be aware of. Now, I am not a nutritionist, and I am not going to tell you what to eat, what not to eat, which diet to follow from the long list of them all. But it is really important that each one of us do some research to figure out what is the best style of eating for me. Some people are very sensitive to sugar. Some people are sensitive to gluten. Some people you know, have other things that they can or cannot eat. But you really want to figure out what is the pattern of fuel that I feed my body and my brain that will give me the best possible energy. I will tell you that sugar is a really bad thing. Uh, for most people. So we, we do want to limit our sugar. I find that when I completely avoid sugar and um, processed foods, I have a ton of energy. So that's something I've learned about myself. So you want to do a little bit of research because remember what we take in, what we eat, we're fueling our bodies. And it's really important to have the right fuel, just like you wouldn't put the wrong kind of gas in your car. And hydration is one that's starting to get a lot more uh, is more talked about now. And that is the importance of drinking enough water. I have a 40 ounce water bottle and I drink three of those a day. So that's 120 ounces. Um, and that is appropriate for a woman, you know, my, my height and weight. But when you look at how much water we're drinking, many of us are also walking around in a constant state of dehydration. And that can affect us physically and emotionally. It's really quite amazing what a difference it makes in how you feel and how you're able to manage stress when you're well hydrated. So social habits, again, having a support network is very beneficial. We've all been feeling a little isolated the last couple of years and depending on your comfort level with getting back out into being, being more socially active, you still wanna have a support network. We are not meant to be lone wolves. Uh, we do need to have people that we can talk to, people that we can share our, our problems with and people just to have some fun. So 
you know, having fun is something we can do. And yes, there are activities we can do on our own. I love to read, but we really want to incorporate some concrete habits of having other people around us. It's important to have people around us who can let us know if they're seeing some of those signs of stress. One of the really important ways to identify our yellow lights are when the people around us can say, boy, you seem grumpy today. Or, and, and you're in a bad mood because I'm noticing something. So quite often the signals come from other people. Uh, my daughter, for example, will notice if I'm sounding snippy and I don't even know I'm sounding snippy, but she will say to me once in a while, mom, are you okay? You sound snippy. And I think, oh, you're right. My frustration is building. I'm, I'm not as patient as I normally am. Yes, I need to implement some of my, my habits uh, and, and work harder at them. And then there may be other things that you might choose to work into your life. Uh, one thing that can be really important if you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed is finding ways to break your tasks down into manageable pieces and celebrating those small successes. We tend to be very good at noticing what we're not doing well, but what we really wanna do is focus on how can I make a goal that is so small that I'll be able to celebrate success often? And how can I set a goal that is something that I have control over so that I can measure my success? So what do I mean by that? If I set a goal to lose 10 pounds, I actually have no control over the scale. And any of you who've tried to lose weight know that, you know, you can have a good day eating and a bad day and the scale doesn't necessarily reflect effort. But what I can do is set a goal that I am going to not eat any processed food or sugar today. I am going to eat a good helping of vegetables or protein or whatever I choose. Those are all things that I can control. And at the end of the day, I can measure success by did I do the things I said I was going to do. So whether that's for you know exercise, uh, if, if my goal is to get in shape, mm, not really specific enough. If my goal is to spend half an hour each day getting my heart rate up to 80% of maximum heart rate, I have absolute control over whether I succeed at that goal. So quite often setting goals in a way that I have control over the measurement will help me to feel successful. Something else you can do when you're setting goals, some people when they are feeling stressed have a tendency to procrastinate. It can be due to overwhelm, it can be due to perfectionism. Again, that, that's sort of a whole other topic. But if I find myself avoiding some of the tasks that I know I need to do, quite often it's because the I, I just don't wanna get up off the couch and do that. It feels overwhelming, it feels daunting, it feels like too much. And so the secret to managing that is to set my goal so small that the pain of avoiding it becomes more than the pain of actually doing it. It's easier to do than avoid. So an example that I've used that I found really helpful, again, beginning of the pandemic, I became a couch potato eating way too much homemade bread, like most of us. And I decided I wanted to exercise more. And I have a rebounder, which is fantastic. And I should probably do an hour on the rebounder. There was no way I was going to do an hour on the rebounder. Like that is so easy to procrastinate because that requires putting on my gym clothes and getting ready and spending a whole hour. And oh my gosh, I'm going to be exhausted. So after a few months of being a couch potato, I decided I could do one song, just one song. So in the evening, when I closed my laptop after work, I would go into the room with the rebounder and do one song. Now I don't even have to put on gym clothes for that. And I would choose an ABBA song and you can laugh, but I'm a child of the seventies. I love the, I love ABBA. And I would, that's three to four minutes. I don't need to procrastinate not doing that. It's just three or four minutes. And I would go in there and I would do one ABBA song. Well, it got to be quite fun. So sometimes I would do two. And before you know it, I was doing one hour Zumba classes and actually managed to survive the entire hour, which when I first started was, was pretty difficult. So I'd love for you to put in the chat right now, looking at these areas under prevention, what is one area? We're not going to change everything. We're not going to do New Year's resolutions. What is one area in that list or something else you can think of that you would be willing to commit to over the next few weeks to start making little tiny changes in that area? So feel free to put something in the chat. Someone's asking about a recording of the meeting. Yes, there will be a recording. Um, hydration, good. Sleep hygiene, awesome. Does coffee count? Oh, well, coffee is dehydrating, but you know what? 
coffee is going to be part of our, our habits too. That's a comfort measure. More fruits and vegetables. Filling up the water bottle. Yes, yeah, sleep. Oh, cutting back on eating. Oh, these are fantastic. They're, they're zipping by so quickly. I can't even, I can't even keep track. But that is fantastic. So again, make a note of what you have uh, committed to and share it with someone. If you can find an accountability partner and just say to somebody, can you hold me accountable on this? I know when I started my healthy eating habits and um, a, a few months ago when I got really into it. I have an accountability partner every day who will say, how are you doing with that? Um, just really important sometimes to be able to have somebody ask you how it's going. Many of us set great plans and goals and then we forget about it. You know, after a couple of days, we revert to our old habits. So I would love it if you would share what you're going to commit to with someone. And it's really important to set small goals and then make them become habits and once they no longer need a lot of uh, remembering, then you can add something else on. I, I mentioned New Year's resolutions, which I don't set. And I think many people have given up because in the past we've set New Year's resolutions like, okay, starting January 1st, I'm going to eat healthy, exercise every day, um, journal every day. And by gyms, no, by January 15th, that attendance goes back down again because we've taken on way too much. I'm a big fan of what I call habit stacking. And again, if you're looking for a book to read, highly recommend Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's a fantastic book. And he talks about how you can make big changes in your life by making little tiny changes and doing them over and over until they become habitual. And that goes along with the work of BJ Fogg, uh, who wrote Tiny Habits, the idea of habit stacking. So I mentioned that I drink 120 ounces a day. I didn't get up one morning and decide I was gonna drink 120 ounces a day. Um, I was drinking, honestly, two cups of coffee and maybe a glass of water. That was really bad, really, really dehydrated. But what I did was I decided, what's something I would never forget to do? I would never forget to have a cup of coffee in the morning. I live for coffee in the morning. Remember, I'm a night person. I get up in the morning and like, don't talk to me till I've had my coffee. So I knew I would never, ever forget to have a cup of coffee. So I started but a year ago, getting up in the morning, pouring my cup of coffee and pouring a big glass of water at the same time. Sometimes I would drink the water before my coffee. Sometimes I would have my coffee first, but I did them together. So I'd be drinking my cup of coffee. And then before I went to get a second cup of coffee, the drink of water had to be gone, the big glass of, of water. That became such a habit. I don't even have to think about it anymore. It's just automatic. I get up in the morning, I pour my coffee and I pour my water and off we go. So once that became a habit, then I got the 40 ounce bottle and filled it up first thing in the morning and it has to be gone by lunch. It sits right beside me all the time. I have a glass, I just keep refilling and I basically don't get to go down for lunch until that bottle is empty. And don't think there haven't been a few times where I'm up here in my office guzzling that last glass of water because I'm hungry and want to go down for lunch and haven't finished my water yet. But somebody's asking, but what if you're in survival mode and the little habit changes might still feel like a mountain? When we're overwhelmed, everything feels like a mountain. The trick is to break these habits down into such tiny pieces, even if it's half a glass of water when you get up in the morning. You really want, that's why the book Atomic Habits is called Atomic. It, it relates to the fact that an atom is the smallest thing that you can measure. You wanna make changes that are so small that they really aren't a mountain yet. Sometimes getting out of bed in the morning and not wanting to crawl back in and pull your head, your head under the covers, that can be just a step of success. I have a client I worked with who was so depressed, she had difficulty getting out of bed. And we started with, when you get out of bed in the morning to go to the bathroom, count to 60 before you go back to bed. Set a timer for five minutes before you go back to bed. And gradually she extended the time so she was actually able to get out of bed, go downstairs, have breakfast with her family. And now she's going for long walks. That, that was somebody diagnosed with PTSD that took two years to get to a point of being able to go, to go outside and, and do things. But you really want to start with something so small that it feels like, what's the point of that? Really? You want me to get out of bed and like stay up for an extra minute? What's that going to do? Not much on its own, but it is going to make a difference. I had another client with agoraphobia. She was afraid to leave her house. And, uh, and she said she wanted to start exercising again, but she really just ended up on the couch all day. And her first piece of homework was to put on her gym clothes when she got her coffee in the morning. 
And I said, can you do that? And she said, yeah, I can do that. Then what? I said, oh, nothing. You can go back to bed. You can go lay on the couch. I don't care, but you'll have your gym clothes on. So well, how's that going to help? I said, wait and see. Turns out, next thing you know, after a couple of weeks of putting on her gym clothes, uh, her husband would say to her, you're already dressed, let's go out in the backyard. Success was being able to go out on her porch and throw her Frisbee for her dog for 40 minutes. That was huge because she had not been able to leave her house. And now she goes for walks by herself with her dog in the neighborhood for an hour, and it's not a problem at all. So it really is just a matter of, of breaking things down into the smallest possible piece because that's how you're going to be able to gradually make those changes. And again, read the book, Atomic Habits. He talks about the British uh, cycling team and how they got a new, a new uh, coach come in uh, who changed everything by making little tiny changes that everybody thought weren't going to make a big difference. So again, you've all picked out something you're going to work on, which is fantastic an area that you're going to change. We've talked about the uh, anything else you find relaxing. Okay, so last thing to talk about the, in prevention is looking at some of these other ideas, just to recap everything. Rec Oops, I just went the wrong way. Okay, trying to close the chat here. So recap, recognize your own unique yellow lights and take steps right away when you start noticing, that's where someone else can be helpful to help you notice. If you're not noticing yourself, someone else who, you know, a loved one or a colleague might say, you know, you seem a bit edgy, everything okay. Prioritize your sleep because that's the foundation. Feed your brain the fuel it needs. In addition to feeding your body the fuel that you need to function, there are certain nutrients that your brain requires. Again, that's a whole other subject of study. There's a fantastic book I recommend called Brain Food. Again, it's a big, heavy text. Textbook. I'm, a, I'm a nerd. I love to read. I'm trying to condense things so you don't need to read all the big books, but some of you might enjoy them. But there are a lot of things that our brain needs to function well cognitively, and a lot of them have to do with healthy fats, omega-3s and olive oil and those sorts of things. So do some research into what kind of fuel helps your brain function better. Following healthy eating habits whenever we can. Again, nobody's perfect, but if we try to make that our, our standard, and remembering that self-care is health care. I can't emphasize that enough. It's not just about in the pandemic, but in general. We've all heard that cliche that's totally overused about putting your own oxygen mask on first. But the reality is we really do need to take care of ourselves first so that we can be in a position at, to help others. That's the only way we can do that. Okay, so your customized plan. Again, you may have a screenshot of the slides. If you'd like a PDF copy of the plan, there's a link there, Alana's gonna post it in the chat. So you can go and request that. There's also a, a shortcut to get there, but uh, there are certainly, you're welcome to uh, request a copy or create your own. Use an Excel spreadsheet, use a journal, whatever you'd like to be like to use. Now we have about two minutes left. I didn't think we'd have much time for questions. So uh, certainly you can email me if you have a question. I will respond in an upcoming issue of my newsletter. I do see that Barb, you have your hand up. Do you have a question you'd like to ask? So you can unmute yourself and ask your question. I was scratching my back. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I just got the hand raised and thought I would ask. Okay, I, yeah, 12.58. Anybody have to have a quick question? We'll take one. I'll just look at the chat and see if anything's come through there. Okay, I think we're good. Yes, the book is uh, Atomic Habits. It's written by James Clear, C-L-E-A-R. Again, my email address is here. If you've forgotten that, you send me an email. I'll certainly respond to let you know what that book was. I also, if you love to read, I can certainly recommend a number of different books. I mean, stress management is certainly, as you know, my passion, but the reason it's my passion is because I work with people every day who have ignored the yellow lights for so long, they have ended up in a situation where they are off work for a year or two. And for those of you who are employers, who are business people, who have people working for you, I don't need to tell you the cost of having employees go off on stress leave. So if there's anything we can do to help people manage stress earlier so they don't end up with a breakdown down. That's absolutely my passion. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed this. Okay. Thank you so much, Diane, for facilitating. I think that we're at a point where we really needed this workshop. Um, so like Diane said, this is recorded. So I will send an email to everybody, including 
the um, link to the recording as well as another link to the workbook or the request for the um, workbook. So again, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon and we will see you guys at our next event. So thanks again. Bye everybody.